Hello and welcome. While COVID-19 has disrupted and impacted almost every aspect of our lives and those of our children, you know, we have felt the effects on childcare and school closures, lack of access to social activities, and even the ability to be social. And let's face it, the list can go on. However, during this time, it is important for us to be mindful of the effects of COVID-19 uh, on families with children with disabilities. Everyday problems are further amplified um, with children with special needs. So what are the effects on these families? Well, today we are joined by our special guest, Ariella Lu, to discuss this very topic. Now, Ariella is a paediatric nurse and director of Kids on Track Consult Consultancy, a private practice in Melbourne. And Ariella consults both locally and overseas, providing expert advice and management uh, strategies for families and advice for families of children with special needs. And today, Ariella is going to share her tips on how we can best prepare children uh, who need support and consistency the most to cope through this COVID-19 era that we are living through. Thank you for joining us today. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, this is, this is great. And as um, we were just talking offline, this is a subject that we haven't yet touched on here at Kiddypedia. And uh, I really want to be able to sort of, I guess, you know, bring, bring this subject to light and support as many families with this information, both locally and uh, sort of around the globe, the people that follow us also. So with regards to the effects of COVID um, on the lives of children with special needs, I'd love to know, um, initially, do you think that, they're, um, that they have been disproportionately affected? And if so, how? they've been disproportionately affected. I think that, you know, I think one of the things that's been interesting about COVID is that all children, I think it's put a magnifying glass on where they struggle, particularly children who struggle with anxiety. That doesn't mean they have special needs. And I think because so many parents have also been anxious, that's kind of triggered how children cope with change. I think where it has been maybe a little bit more difficult within the special needs community is I think we're talking about children who without school regular weekend programs support <coughs> stuff like that these are children that can become very isolated very quickly and more than just the children their parents as well um, I know at one point very early on um, sort of in the Melbourne lockdown so to speak I had a conversation with a mum and and I was setting up something for her and she said to me, you know, I literally, she said, haven't seen another human being. Like I haven't, my daughter hasn't interacted with anyone. Her daughter's nonverbal and whatever. So it's not like she can really have a conversation like this via Zoom. You know, I think, so I think that, I think that isolation potentially has been felt a lot more keenly um, during this time. Um, but I think, in terms of the things that have, and, and I guess also the ideas of sort of a lot of children with special needs get used to what they're used to. Yes. And they follow in their head the way things go are rules. So when you're saying something like, and thank goodness in Melbourne it's finished now, but when you're saying something like you're doing homeschool, right? And the word we were all using was homeschooling. Well, it's not school. They're not in their uniform and they're not at their desk and they're not with their normal, you know, support aides and teachers. So I think that's been felt a lot more keenly. Yes, yes. Now, we published your article titled Helping Our Special Needs Children Through COVID-19. Now, for someone who hasn't yet read the article, can you please just give us an overview of what the article is about and what inspired you to write it? Yeah, so I think what inspired me to write it is I think I was hearing more and more in my practice about examples of where children were um, either right at the beginning before homeschooling, where there were changes in school and things like there was one little girl that I was talking to her mum who was unable to do something for herself, um, tie her shoelaces when they became undone. And they became undone and because they've been told the rule was you can't, the teachers can't touch you. She didn't know that she could ask for help. So she stayed sitting on her chair for the whole day. 
because she didn't want to get up because she knew that she would fall and she didn't know that actually there were exceptions mm. where the teacher could help, you know, and they didn't know to do that. So I think, you know, that's just one example of stories that I've been hearing that actually for children to kind of understand there are rules, but there aren't really rules. And together with the social isolation that I was hearing about, it was really to give, which I guess comes into your question about the overview, a thing to parents of like, okay, first of all, how can we use this time <clears throat> positively actually give our children, special needs or not, to be honest, some life skills about how to cope when life is uncertain? Because yes. I think it's something that none of us do very well, to be honest. Like, you know, a lot of us, I think, have struggled um, during COVID with uncertainty. I think, I think anybody in the world would be lying if they said their life on some level or other has not had a degree of uncertainty, be it uncertainty economics, be that, you know, as in the last few interviews I've done talking about COVID, I always say, like, for me, um, as you can hear, I'm not from Melbourne, so <laughs> my family are not here. So for us, the whole, and my husband's also, so for us, the whole travel and when will we actually, obviously we talk on Zoom and FaceTime, but it's not the same. It so is, when yeah. we able to actually, everybody's had these areas of uncertainty. Marks. Yes. This is yeah. uncharted territory. So I think one idea was really, how do we deal with those life skills? And the second was really, I think the biggest thing that's come out for a lot of children is these huge states of anxiety when a lot of children again special needs or not I must just say before I offend anybody but particularly in the special needs community a lot more meltdowns a lot more tantrums a lot more needing their own space because when they're not having a variety of spaces through the day it, it's kind of tricky to still get everything they need so I think that those were really you know the overviews of the things that I wanted to cover yes. those kind of how we how do we help our children and, and I guess things. for some of our audience that are unfamiliar with the challenges that children with special needs have been experiencing through the COVID era in particular could you maybe mm -hmm. just explain just briefly what some of those um those challenges are and how they're any different to 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 I guess day-to-day -day life okay so I would say um Let's maybe take the top three that I, you know, right. would say top three. I would say the first one, as we talked about right at the beginning, is that idea of social isolation. A lot of children with special needs, even those that are the highest function, are going to struggle or have seemed to have, in my experience at least, struggled more on platforms <laughs> like this. When the contact isn't face-to-face, -face, it's very hard for them to maintain a conversation and a friendship and a connection in the, in the same way. Whereas for us, we might still say it's a poor second. For them, it's something they actually, for many, I'm not saying for everybody, there's no one size fits all, of course, but for many, that's, I think that's been a thing and that's been really, you know, affected a lot, a lot of kids. That's number one. I think number two is many children with um, special needs, all sorts of special needs, do best when their routine is very clear mm -hmm. and visual schedules they know what they're doing and when and with who and what and without having that their anxiety can become quite high quite quickly now obviously we all know children like that special needs or not but in the special needs community that is a much higher there's a much higher incidence mm -hmm. of that that's the second thing and i think the third thing i would say is that some of these children there are children in the world for whom school is a part of their world yes or youth group is a part of their world and when those things are removed they can do more in the other parts of their world to give them the same inputs for a lot of children with disabilities the parents ha don't have the time necessarily or the resources or the energy to actually be able to give when those other resources have been taken away. <clears throat> those children, never mind the social, but also just from a point of view of activities and what they have exposure to, I think their world has narrowed and yes. become a lot. And, and in saying that, and um, as you've just referenced parents, what are some of the most common challenges you find parents 
with special needs uh, children have been uh, experiencing? Exhaustion. I think all parents, to be fair, when homeschooling was going on, were suffering from exhaustion. But I think the, these were children who, you know, I think for some parents of children not with special needs, once you've got your kids in front of their project for the day or their homeschool for the morning or whatever it was, that was it. Like, you could go make a phone call. You could leave them unsupervised for 20 minutes, half an hour. These kids, you can't. So if they were at homeschool, so were you as a parent. Yes. If, uh, you know, if they were, whatever they were doing. So that's one challenge. I think the second challenge was when lockdown was really at its peak. And when, and not that I'm saying, you know, with the question of the second wave now, not that I'm saying none of this will come back, but when a few months ago, that sort of end of March to end of April, things were at their worst. Um, and thank goodness we haven't got back there. I think many parents were nervous for good reason to have too many people in the house. So there are some parents who would maybe have through the course of a week, four or five different support workers. Many of them cut that down to only having one or two. So they were needing to be on call a lot more. A lot more was based yes. was put on in terms of physical care, never mind anything else, but that physical care and that's physical. So I think, I think that's been another thing for parents. And I think like the last thing for parents is there are, and this is something that wouldn't bother the children, but certainly it's true. There are many children with additional needs who due to sort of coexisting medical conditions are, have lower immunity. So parents are needing to be almost even more cautious. Yes. Once they to lock down, they're not going to take the risk because, you know, one thing's going to trigger another thing. So I think for some parents, that's also been, you know, a big pressure trying to tread that line of what's too cautious and what, you know, where, where's the line between cautious and, you know, unnecessarily pessimistic. Yes. And I mean, how do you see um, the support for families with special need families alter during this time? Uh, and how about, I guess, maybe the concerns about the access to specialised care? Has that tended to improve as we've, um, as you've referenced, that we sort of had that sort of time of lockdown, but currently at the moment in, in, in Victoria, um, you know, in many sort of uh, suburbs that we, we do, and we are back into stage three. So, I mean, so what is happening, I guess, with, with regards to the access to specialised care at the moment? So, thankfully, um, from what I'm hearing, things are much better with that. I think even when it was at its worst, there were a lot of sort of, I don't want to just call them youth groups, but a lot of the more social activities organizations were trying to run certain programs on Zoom and stuff like that. One of the things I was thrilled to read um, when I read about the new lockdowns, not that I was thrilled about the lockdowns, let me just clarify, but last time when it gave four reasons for going out of your home. Yes. It's about you could go for work, but it didn't explicitly say caregiving in the way that it does now or certainly not in anything I read whereas this time it said to receive or to give care which I'm hoping means that the support workers this time you know from the look what parents choose to do they may still choose to be cautious yes but, but I, I was very happy to see that wording then as it said could have been there last time and I missed it, but this time I saw it specifically because I looked out for it and I was very, very happy to see that. Well, on that, even if home nurses are available, many families um, may have chosen, I guess, to suspend service to limit the exposure um, of COVID-19 as staff are providing service and travelling between multiple homes, I guess. So for parents, I guess the lack of support and resources paired with extra care responsibilities due during COVID-19 may have compounded, I guess, the physical and mental health challenges that they're already experiencing. So I'd love to know, what are your thoughts on this? Well, first of all, I, I agree with everything that you said on that. I really, I totally agree. I think one of the things just for parents to take, when I was actually talking to um, somebody who runs a nurse agency today um, about something. And one of the things she said is it's, they have had the policy 
that they've changed all the hours of everybody so that all their workers are only working with one maximum two families a week and they've kind of put that into place so I think a lot of the support agencies certainly the ones that are working with families with more needs or where there are higher risks of cross infection certainly while the DHS DHHS don't say it directly that certainly is best practice that many agencies are following so that um that should be good news but I also think it's really important you know nobody no parent can be the be all and end all for their child and I think that was one of the biggest mental health things <laughs> for all parents you know for everybody it was you were suddenly the friend the confidant the school teacher the cruise ship director the entertainment organizer <laughs> had to schedule them 24 hours a day, the nanny, the babysitter, you were everything. You were the grandparent, you, you, there, there was no role you didn't have to fulfill. And I think that's one thing when you're a parent and that's difficult enough. <laughs> You've got a child for whom normally you get a night off a week because you're, you know, you've got a respite carer coming in or you, you, know, you have someone coming to do bath time, bedtime because you've got a 17 year old that can't do it themselves and you're having to do that I think it really is so vitally important for parents to and older siblings if applicable to split that responsibility if you're only reliant on who's in the house and you're unable to get outside help for whatever reason that in order to minimize the physical effects that you split that as much as you can with your partner with your other children where you can and also to know there are agency, as I said at the beginning, there are agencies that are able to hopefully provide you just with a little bit, even if you can take one thing off yourself or give yourself that, you know, hour, twice a week where you can just go for a walk, knowing that your child is being taken care of by somebody. I think that's... It's really important. And, you know, I guess the whole COVID era has really forced us um, a lot to slow down and has provided a wonderful opportunity for families to spend more quality time together indoors. But um, on the topic of isolation, children um, need the company and so social interaction with other children. And as you mentioned earlier, so I'd love to know from your perspective, how do you see isolation affecting um, in particular the learning and development of uh, children with special needs? Uh, I think it's such a difficult question to answer because I think every child is so different. So before I say anything, I would like to say to any parents that are listening out there that have a child with additional needs, this is in no way saying this is your child. This is saying across the board, these are the things. I think, first of all, one of the things that is most important, I believe, in education as a whole is that children are being taught in the medium through which they learn the best okay and i think that one of the things that covid has done is it's basically forced all children into one media that's what homeschooling did there was there were no options unless you were a key worker's child or whatever and even if they weren't doing that there weren't schools that were open there was no physical you know in person and i think there were many parents without children with diagnosed additional needs that I've spoken to since COVID that said, you know what, I really saw my kids struggle to do this and struggle to do that. At the same time, the parents have said, oh my gosh, I never want to send my kid back to school. That was like amazing. They did so much better without the background noise and the distractions of everyone around them. So I think that that certainly to sort of the lesser extent of additional needs, would say some of the problems and positives that there'd been. I think the more, I hate the word severe, but I, I think it's the best word to use. The more, I guess, intense the needs are, the more needs your child has, has been the more they've missed out by not having school. So if you have a child who is in a special educational environment every day, as part of school, they're also getting speech therapy, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, um, as we talked about before with sort of the nappy changes and the, the school's got all the equipment, they're doing all of that for you. So I think by them being at home, it isn't just they've missed the social, but all of those extra therapies, which also 
if you're having private therapy, some of them have moved online, but not all therapists moved online. Not everybody did, and not all the school therapists could. So, and I know that a lot of, particularly here in Victoria, a lot of the special needs schools did go back. The minute they were allowed to open, they opened and all the kids went back. There was no kind of staggered entry once they were open. You know, they were open obviously with following guidelines before I get anyone into trouble. Um, you know, and, and I think that was very positive because I think what these kids missed was not just the yes. social, it was the entire, every way we tried to work with these children to nurture them all kind of went off the beaten track, so to speak. Yeah. And in the article, you suggest that um, in situations like this, that parents of children with additional and special needs should find a social story that explains coronavirus and why uh, we have to be so careful all the time. Um, can you explain first um, what a social story is? Right, so a social story, basically, um, I don't know if you remember, like, when you were little, but certainly when I was little in the UK, when um, there was a series called Topsy and Tim, and it existed of real life examples. So Topsy and Tim go to the park, Topsy and Tim go to the dentist, Topsy and Tim go to the library, Topsy and Tim. And the point was to tell the story of what happens in those places. So you know they go to the library and they meet the librarian and how many books they're allowed to take out and to stamp the books. Obviously I was a child a while ago, so <laughs> it is an outdated example. But a social story is rather than it being Topsy and Tim, if your child is Mark, it would be, um, you know, why is life different for Mark during COVID? And every page would have, you can do it in a page or you can do it as a post it doesn't really matter. Um, but if you want to make it specific to your child, you, talk, you give pictures of their school, their house, their mummy and daddy. So you know, put the, the children into the story. You put the child into the story. So it would say something like, you know, we've talked a lot about the return to school. When Mark goes back to school, his classroom will look different because, and you would speak to his particular school about who's not going to be in the class anymore. Can they take a picture of what it's going to look like? So it's very, very specific. So rather than him reading a generic, when schools go back, they are following social distancing. It doesn't mean anything because what does that mean like particularly to a child that with additional needs it doesn't mean anything when you're actually saying okay when your school goes back instead of having three desks in the room there's only going to be two instead of the desks being in a circle they're going to be separated wonderful instead of three teachers there's only whatever it is that's specific that's giving the specific what he's going to expect which will hopefully help to minimise that anxiety. So where can parents find them then? And do you have any suggestions or recommendations which ones we should look out for? Okay, so first of all, if you go online and you Google COVID social stories, there are a million. They're all kind of pretty generic. So it's not going to have your child's name and whatever, but it will at least start to explain, certainly the last part of you know my comment about explaining why we have to be careful and the, you know, the universal proportions talking about things like there's going to be hand sanitizer, no hugging, no cut, things like that, that would be in there, certainly. If you want to make it specific to your child, my recommendation would be go and Google social stories as a whole. Go and look up a few different examples, whether you look up new babies, whether you look up going to the dentist, whether it doesn't matter what you look up and look at the style of writing. And then what you're aiming to do Get some pictures. Most parents have a million pictures on their phone. And you want to basically show your child through a social story what is changing, but also what is remaining the same so that the anxiety doesn't become out of control. So that would be my first point of call. So, so parents that want to sort of look at making specific stories, that if your child has an OT or if you are working, you know, certainly for my clients, I've helped them, you know, develop for their kids. So obviously, you know, I would be happy to do it if your child has an OT. They do this stuff all the time. They would be more than happy to do it. There are a lot of speech therapists that do it. So ask your team who's working with your child and who knows your child and knows your child's circumstances to help you with that. And most of them will be more than willing to do so. And how and why do you find that they're so effective? Because I think 
for a lot, first of all, this definitely doesn't apply to children with additional needs, but this one really doesn't. Children are much more likely to understand why it impacts them when they can see their examples are specific to them. So when they see this is really about their life, their world, their house, their mummy, their dog, their whatever it is, it's talking to them. Um, and I also think it puts it out there in black and white. We talked before about the idea of children following rules and particularly um, children with additional needs on, often need things drawn out in black and white. This is yes, this is no, these are the rules and that is that. It's a very good way to do that also in a way that your child can come back to. It's a book. So they don't just read it once and that's it. You've expected them to absorb it. That's a book that they can take with them to school. You can read it to them before bed. They can flick through it themselves if they can read or particularly if you do a picture version of it or whatever. It's something they can process over time, mm -hmm. which I think is important. And um, at the start of the conversation, um, you referenced um, uncertainty, um, not just for, for children with additional needs, but all children. Yeah. But I'd love to know from your perspective, your perspective, <laughs> why uncertainty is more challenging to deal with um, for children with special needs. I think many children with special needs are not as good at being flexible and adaptable. Um, I think that when I talk about not dealing with change, I think one of the things, and you know, I just, we talked before about children being able to process something over a period of time. I think one of the things that has been the most challenging um, with COVID is not just the uncertainty of what's happening, but also that when things change, they change very quickly. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, you're in school one day, by the end of the next week, you're not there anymore. Like it, it, it hasn't been, you know, and it's had to be that way. Uh, absolutely, it's had to be that way. But that is quite challenging. And for someone who struggles to be adaptable, or someone who struggles to deviate from their normal routine, which many children with additional needs do, and particularly those on the spectrum, um, anywhere on the spectrum, actually do struggle with that and spend a lot of time working on that. Um, that's very challenging because when they feel there is uncertainty, they become anxious, that can set off sort of other, making them be a little bit more on edge. So you are more likely to then be dealing with meltdowns or challenging behavior Even because they land their landlines. And, and, and what are some strategies that can help to um, combat uncertainty for, for kids? So I think putting uncertainty in places where you can, whilst not promising certainty in places where you can't. Mm -hmm. So for example, there are certain things that for all kids, in theory, have no need to have changed. Mm -hmm. So morning routine, other than the fact that if they're not going to school, they're on school uniform, they still need to get up, they still need to get dressed, they still need to brush their teeth, they still need to have breakfast. If they're at that age where they're making their beds or putting their pajamas in a laundry hamper or whatever, those things they still need to do. And same in the evening. So I think doing something like a visual schedule, almost like a tick chart, you know, we all know how satisfying it is to tick something off a to-do list and that sense of accomplishment of like, yes, I did it. But that gives children a sense of continuity. Yes. And it's also, not everything's changed. We still get dressed in the morning and we still brush our teeth in the morning and we still have dinner at night and we still have a bath. So that's where things haven't changed. I think where things have changed, it's also about seeing where you can provide certainty. So, you know, I'm running next week um, a camp. One of my clients is running a camp for um, special needs kids. And sort of I've been in charge of sort of all the policies. And we try to be very open with these are the changes. So for parents who I know their children have higher anxiety, I've been speaking to ongoing saying, okay, explain this and explain this and explain. So I can't give them every certainty. Of course I can't, but I can tell them this is what's different. Yes. I tell them how that's going to make their choice. So if your child is going back to when they are back at school or when they are, feel free to ask and actually say by providing what's new, 
New doesn't mean uncertain because as you and I were discussing at the beginning, COVID's going to be around for a while. So some of these changes are not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. I don't see us with the hand sanitizer anytime soon. I don't see suddenly being allowed, you know, you know, children, you know, 400 kids in assembly anytime soon. In, like, I don't, I don't see that that's happening anytime soon. So new and different doesn't necessarily mean constant change. It means the new normal. So I think it's about, as a parent, advocating for your child to understand what is that new normal and then find a way to pre-prepare your child for what it will look like. So I'm hearing that consistency is the key at times of uncertainty and change. And this is because it helps the children to process the information. Is this right? Yeah, and I think, well, first of all, process, but also to feel that they're not living in quicksand. You know, like, I, and I think for all of us, if we think of times of big transition in our lives, right, in our own lives, whether that's a new baby, a house move, or whatever, those are the times that we generally grasp the tightest to the things that provide us with consistency and security. Be they routines, be they people, be they work. There are a lot of people who during these times, I mean, <laughs> last year we had, in our house, we had to replace I always try and give stories to demonstrate what I'm saying, but we try, we had to replace all the carpets in our house. In order to replace all the carpets in our house, you have to pack up all your stuff because they only move, anyway, whatever, it was a nightmare. But I was going away for a week and I was going overseas. So basically I said to my husband, I can't handle this. There's too much change in one go. You do it while, <laughs> while I've gone. I'll organize the packers for you. I'll organize the movers for you. I'll do all of that. But I can't, act, like, it was too much at once and I said and if I am here I said I'm going up the road to go work for the day and you can supervise it. so the point of my story is all of us in times where we feel that it's too overwhelming and I think that's the thing about change and uncertainty it makes us feel totally overwhelmed because we feel like we can't actually get a grip on the floor nothing's normal the minute we feel life is not normal we need to cling to some form of routine structure and normality. Mm -hmm. So I think about figuring out what those things are, it's true for adults as well, by the way, for any individual, whether they are work, whether they are individual people, whether they are, particularly for the little ones, okay, you thinking about getting rid of, rid of the dummy? Now is probably not the time. <laughs> if they're struggling with additional uncertainty, now is not the time to get rid of something that's providing them with safety and security. So what are some of the processes parents can provide consistency for children then? You mentioned um, it's the visual charts, it's, the, it's so they, they visually can see things. Is there anything else? Yes, I think, yes, I think visual schedules are very important. Um, visual ones that they can see that are on the wall. I think things like, dis, things like rules at home, keeping those consistent. You know, if the rule normally is no jumping on the furniture, it shouldn't just because everything else is uncertain, suddenly there's no rules at home either. Like that, you know, I think that's important. I think parents presenting a united front wherever possible in two parent households. I think parents having a united front of this is how we're dealing with this as a family. I think that provides um, a security. I think having tying a little bit more strictly than normal to routines. And when I say routines, I know there are parents worldwide that have raised their eyebrows. I don't mean a routine that has to be tied to, this is five o'clock, this is 5.30, this is six o'clock, this is 6.30. I mean a routine that says, one comes before two, comes before three, comes before four. The, the most basic point of a routine is, we sleep at night, we're up during the day. So it's, it's making sure that actually, those normal things that we're doing, whilst a lot of things may have changed within our routine, where we can keep them the same, we do keep them the same. Yes. And, and do you think that, that parents can use this time to teach their children that change in life is inevitable? And if so, I mean, how can they do this? I think, first of all, I think change in life is inevitable. Um, I think we're living in a time of, it, not just extreme change, but as I've said, extreme uncertainty, 
which breeds anxiety. And I think that's what's been one of the biggest challenges of COVID, that it's kind of like, as soon as we got used to one set of rules, no sooner we kind of like, okay, yeah, good, we're sorted, then it was another one. So no one ever really felt secure. The, the most secure people felt with all the problems of it was lockdown. And as much as people got fed up, with lockdown, you knew those were the rules and that was that. And it was that for quite a significant period of time. But both from when COVID started until lockdown and when lockdown was lifted until now, almost weekly, we've gone through, you know, restriction changes for better or for worse and, you know, how that's gone. And I think change, obviously, we're talking about COVID specifically, but I think for children to learn that things do change, is important and I think I wouldn't if you're trying to actually teach your child that as a lesson I would be using things from their past experience where things have changed so all children who are of school age and have done more than one year of childcare will know that every year they get a new teacher in 99% of cases right when you move up a school year that's a new teacher it's a new classroom for any children that have gone from kinder to main school or uh, you know to primary school primary school to high school that's a change so it's not necessarily about talking about you know, these big monumental changes if you know god forbid there's been like a death in the family that's a big change that's a change in family dynamic if you know they've got a sibling that's younger than them and you know I, I, i'm not talking about sort of you know there's literally a year's age gap but if it's sort of three years or more they may well remember life before that sibling that's a change in family dynamic grandma wasn't well for a while that's a change so actually sort of showing them that they've already navigated change successfully and come to the other side they used to be in nappies now they're toilet trained they used to have a dummy now they don't they used to sleep in mummy and daddy's bed now they're in their own bed so actually empowering them that you know what You've dealt with tougher than this. You've dealt with change before. It might not have been quite so hectic, but you, we've done this, you've done this, and you're good at this. And try to teach, I guess, kids to draw on the strategies that have worked before. And I guess thinking as parents, obviously, in additional needs, it might be difficult to get them to think back, but for you as a parent to think back and think, okay, when the goldfish died, how did I explain? How did I explain that, and what helped, and what didn't help? So I think that that. But yes, I think this is a fantastic opportunity to because I think special needs or not, we don't probably spend enough time equipping children with life skills, and this is a life skill when all is said and done. Um, coping with it, and even as adults, some of us cope with it very well and some of us you know cope with some of it well and, and and i think yeah i think it's a great opportunity for that yeah totally agree and you mentioned anxiety uh, just before also i mean do you have any particular tips and advice to help parents manage and support the, their child if they're suffering um from anxiety and um that said also how can we take anxiety caused by these changes uh, to help build resilience, particularly in children who have additional needs or are suffering from anxiety? Okay, so I think in terms of suffering from anxiety, I think there are a few things to say. So first of all, everything that we've talked about with regard to increasing consistency, that will help. That will absolutely, so you've kind of got to look at the wider problem in terms of there is anxiety, We've got to acknowledge that it's there, right? And put in the consistencies, that will always help. Second of all, I think opening up conversations, even if you're not using the word anxiety, but ask having conversations with your child about how they're feeling. I can see you seem quiet today. What happened? You know, is anything wrong? Um, you know, I think things like that are very important. I think also depending on how and I'll give a couple more specific strategies, but I also think depending on how that anxiety is manifesting itself is also how we need to help kids deal with it. So if you've got a child who anxiety seems to be out of control, not just in one area, but everywhere. 
So, you know, you've had a child that always, let's say, had separation anxiety, but now there's separation anxiety. They won't sleep on their own at night. They won't, there's anxiety around food. Everything is causing anxiety. I, this is probably the time where, you know, thinking about do we actually, does, do I need to get professional help for my child? Not in a bad way, but especially for those kids that are a little bit older to empower them to be able to talk through their feelings or find ways to identify that things that calm them down we all have things that calm we all get anxious everybody does and you know there's anxious that we just feel a little bit unsettled and you know it'll go away but we all have times where we're really anxious and we actually need to remove ourselves from the situation and go do something else for a while in order to be re to revisit it now obviously that's a skill that we learn over time as adults. But children, not everyone learns how to do that. And some people need help in doing that. So the first thing I would say is if you're really thinking your child is extremely anxious and more so than before, reach out. There are so many amazing psychologists out there and organizations working in children's mental health. We talked before about parents' mental health, but children's mental health is also an issue and it's also very important. Um, the second thing is we talked before about showing children what they've done before to help them overcome challenges. And I think to have, whether you do it visually or whether you do it as a game or however you do it, but to have something to kind of show them what they are good at and building them up with the things they're good at for not just the things that calm them down, but if you've got a child who is particularly talented at, I don't know, football, basketball, drama, art, whatever it is, use that. Use that to give them time every day to be doing something that one is going to calm them, but also is going to make them feel good about themselves. And, and the third is to really, the, the third is to verbalize to them, as I said, what other strategies they've used before to help themselves feel better so that these kids can build their own toolbox. The next is to really open those conversations about emotions. You know, there are those amazing posters that you can get saying, how do you feel today? And it's got every emoji face under the sun. But there are a lot of very clear, so, uh, kids with additional needs. If you go on to some of the sensory um, websites with sensory equipment and the learning tools and stuff like that, they've got some fantastic, for all ages actually, games that you can play, things that you can do to really get children to express how they feel. Even for what kids that are nonverbal, there's different faces. They can point to how they feel. They know how they're feeling. They just not, may not be able to say it. Um, one thing that I use with a lot of my clients that sometimes goes quite well um, is at the end of the day, before, this, before your child goes to sleep, is to use what I call a worry box. So you basically talk about the day and you start with sort of what did you do today, da, 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 da. and then you go into more, but you go into more specific questions. Who did you play with? Did this, and then when it's kind of they've calmed down and they're relaxed, you actually say, "What was your worst part of today? Was there or was there anything today that upset you?" And some of the time they're going to say, "No, they had a lovely day," but a lot of the time, a child with anxiety, something will still be in their head. And we're always, depending on the age and stage and whatever, encourage parents to do, you write it down or you draw it on a picture. They put that piece of paper in the box. That box goes out of their room because it's bedtime. So out of their head, mummy's now got that in the box. And the next night when you start the worry box, you bring out yesterday's worry to see if it's still a worry. So, you know, yesterday it was kind of like Johnny didn't play with me. And you can say, how was Johnny today? And it's opening up that emotional conversation about the things that may be worrying them. And yes, you may only be dealing with the symptoms of anxiety. So, you know, Johnny not playing with him, he's more attuned to that at the moment, but it's still giving them an opportunity to talk about what they're holding inside. And I would say anything is better than nothing. Yes. With an action. 
they're, they're great tips. And I lo love the idea of the worry box. Now, speaking about um, parents, just as we sort of wrap up, you know, with regards to support, I mean, how can friends and family of children with special needs uh, support parents during this time? And if they don't necessarily um, have enough support around them, I mean, are there any other uh, government support and advocacy groups um, that parents may not have heard before um, that you, you can suggest that parents can reach reach out to and or that, that could help? Okay, so in terms of advocacy groups, I think if your child is on any sort of NDIS plan and you are on any sort of NDIS managed plan, if you're struggling, speak to your fund, speak to your plan managers about whether it's possible to get in some extra support work. Actually say to them, like I know I just did a plan recently for a client and the first thing they sent in writing the plan was all the support organizations that they thought might be able to help in this particular client's case. So if you are already working with any kind of uh, social services network, for want of a better term, go to them and actually say, listen, I'm struggling with getting time for myself, finding time for my other kids. It's become worse because of COVID. I'm struggling with, what can you recommend? Most people on NDIS plans, there have been a lot, a lot of plans um, through COVID and particularly if things do worsen, please God they won't, but if they do, where extra funding has been able to be given to families that need extra support hours or need, you know, extra session with a psychologist or whatever it is, that has, that has been going on. So that would be my first place in terms of advocacy. It, difficult to give a list of organisations because it really depends what the what the needs are but you know obviously i'm happy to talk to people individually in terms of friends you know i think we talked a minute ago about mental health and i think mental health apart from the fact there's still way more taboos than there should be i think when we talk about mental health we imagine we still and we shouldn't imagine people that are completely nuts and like can't cope with life the vast majority of people that i see that who would define themselves as saying i'm worried about my own mental health are coping brilliantly and they're doing the best they can in very difficult circumstances and you would never know that when they get into bed at night they're sobbing because they're just so tired or they are anxious every minute about is my child going to get covid and if they do how am i going to cope with the lockdown and the isolation with a child that can't fend for themselves or whatever it is and I think one of the, I was talking about, you know, my family living in the UK and the lockdown has been a lot more severe there than it ever was here. And it's gone on a lot longer. And one of like the really lovely things um, that I've seen is how much people have made a concerted effort. I'm not saying everyone, but certainly in my family's case, to check in with each other, to set up WhatsApp groups, to have zoom dates like you know we're having an interview now but they were talking about so instead of they all go out on a tuesday night on a girls night they all sit with their own bottle of wine <laughs> bottle of wine at their five separate computers and they do it there sometimes i think just the power of saying to someone with an additional child how's ruby doing i've been thinking of you i know it must have been so and particularly if you're hearing this to be able to reach out and say i promise you it's been harder for them and the challenges have been possibly something you may not have had with your own children if they don't have an additional needs. No one's going to get upset that you reach out and say, how are you doing? I'm going to the shops today. Can I pick something up for you? To take one little thing off them is not prying into their lives, right? There, there's that line between like, oh, you must be struggling. I'll come fix it for you. And there's the line of, you know, we talked about these lockdown suburbs that are locked down again now. If you're in those, you know, and I just heard today about a business who was saying, they were interviewed on TV last night apparently, on one end of the road, there's a pub restaurant that's still allowed to open and on the other end of the road, they're not. So you may well be, if you're in those 10 suburbs in Victoria, that your friends are allowed to be out more than you are. If you are the friend that's allowed to be out, and you've got a friend with a special needs child or something like that, phone and say, I'm going to get, I'm going to Coles. What can I get you? 
or on your way back from Coles, just leave bread and milk on the doorstep. No one's, no one's gonna say that was horrible. And I think it's getting that line between pretending we know what goes on behind closed doors, which let's be honest, you and I both know in our lines of work, we don't have a clue. Um, and actually just saying human being to human being, I wanna help you. Yes, very, very powerful. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, I think it's just been mindful more so than ever um, of other people, other people's lives. Um, now we've spoken about so much. This has been an incredible conversation, um, Ariella. Okay. If you were to um, summarize your key messages for anyone watching and listening, what would they be? Um, so I'm going to leave like the one that I really want people to hear till the end. Um, I think first of all, um, COVID has been difficult for everybody. Parents, children, grandparents on many, many levels. Um, and I think whatever you're feeling with or dealing with, reach out, get the help you need. Don't feel that you have to suffer this in silence. This could be a long road. Do what we need to do. I think that's number one. I think number two, as you said, being mindful of those around us that may be going through challenges that we may not have experienced ourselves, but it doesn't mean that we can't be empathetic. Um, I think also to just really have an awareness that when we're talking about anxiety, change and uncertainty, let's not all pretend that we're all so big and brave. Let's not all pretend that, you know, you started with that sentence of COVID wreaked havoc with everybody. Unless you're living under a rock, this has wreaked havoc with everybody. Let's not, let's look for ways to make the most of where we are and to use those strategies to minimize the effects. And the final thing, which I said I was gonna to lead to last, I think people right now, re you talked about mindful before, but really need to make sure they're being kind to themselves. This one, this message is actually particularly for parents. I think, you know, for a lot of parents, there are things that parents do on a weekly or two weekly basis or three weekly basis that have disappeared with COVID meeting friends for lunch, going and getting a manicure, no jokes, but going and getting a leg wax. Like it's the kind of thing where we're blocking out half an hour of time just for us. When all the restrictions came in, we stopped doing that because we couldn't. And there were the gym, right? Going back to gym. I'm not saying we, everyone's ready to go back to those things. We're not necessarily. But so those things still need to be replaced with something. If you've got kids that can't be left unsupervised, find a night where your husband, where someone can be there so that for half an hour, you can go take a bath or lie on your bed and read a book. Find a time that can still be your time in order that we all come out of this as unscathed as possible. And that's my biggest thing. Actually be kind to yourself. At the moment, none of us are achieving as much. Be kind to yourself. Yes. Great advice. Ariella, if anyone's got any other questions and or want to find you and or your business, whereabouts can they find you? So we have a website, um, www.kidsontrackconsultancy.com. Um, so you're welcome to find me there. We've also got a Facebook page um, or Instagram and all of our contact details um, are there. And I think on the article that went on your website, um, a lot of those are up there too. So Wonderful. Thank you so much for the conversation today. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the next one. Take care. Looking forward as well. Pleasure. Take care. Take bye care. Bye. bye.